Interesting, though, that uh, in British Columbia, you know, if you're looking at things from a, a pro-life, pro-family perspective, that's where the real heartbreakers were. But in Atlantic Canada, I guess I'm a bit biased because this is our, our home now here in New Brunswick. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think most of, I think pretty much all the wins in Atlantic Canada were strong, value-based candidates. These are the things that we believe in. First, that parents have the right to raise their children the way they want. Second, that those we elect to serve us in civil government must respect and defend our right of belief and freedom of religion. Number three, that the laws and policies of civil government must provide for the safety and security of the citizens, especially the vulnerable among us. And number four, that it is inappropriate to heap debt upon the backs of our children and future generations. They came from you. They're your pillars. Hi, Doug Sharp, your host of the National Leadership Briefing, and this is the Midweek Touchpoint. Well, just moments ago, I got off of a call with Fatine of For My Canada and Scott Hayward, founder of the organization right now, and we had a conversation just following up on the election, getting some views from each of us as to exactly what it is that we saw, some immediate takeaways, and I thought I would share this with you today as the Midweek Touchpoint, because I'd love for you to kind of hear our perspectives uh, from as from the perspective of people who sit and behind desks that deal with these types of things all the time. Now, we also believe that our conversation is going to be helpful is, as a foundation for the next conversation we're going to be sharing with you. And that is when we as strategists in within the faith communities of Canada that deal with things like elections and how to get people elected and working with political processes, these sorts of things, we believe that this conversation today is going to be foundation and helpful for you to know as we move into the next steps. We're actually going to be launching another call in a couple of weeks, which is going to give some advice to you as to some of the things that you can do moving forward as these changes have occurred, really, because whenever there's an election, there are changes. But as these changes have occurred, have occurred, there have also been opportunities created. And we want you to be a participant with us in capitalizing and seizing these opportunities so that we can further advance the principles of the four pillars. Now, these things I invite you to consider today. But if you, uh, if you don't have time to watch the whole thing, archive it and watch it at some point in time, because I'm sure you'll be blessed to know the minds of Fatine and, of course, Scott Hayward from right now. In the meantime, and until next time, God bless you, God bless your family, and may God continue to bless this great nation of Canada. Enjoy the video. Well, hello everyone, Faye Teen here. It is just a couple of days since the 2021 federal election and there is so much to look at to chop up to talk about and here with me to have a conversation about it all is none other than Doug Sharp from the National Leadership Briefing and also Scott Hayward from It Starts Right Now. I can think of few others that I would rather be getting some reflection commentary from than the two of you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Good to be here. Thanks for having us on. Okay, well, I know we were all up super late on Monday night. I think Rob and I were up here till about 3 a.m. Atlantic Standard Time, just watching the speeches, watching all the numbers come in. Obviously, mail-in ballots still being counted even till today, but the results are pretty much in a liberal minority government. Let's talk broad brush takeaways. What are some of the key things that you guys noticed on election night? Doug, why don't you go first? Okay, well, broad brush, big and broad brush is is that uh, I share the the concern that many Canadians have across the nation about the fact that we even had an election, and I don't want to rush too far past that initial concern because we need our prime minister and this liberal government to wear the six hundred and ten million dollars that they just spent on an election that they said they wouldn't have during the pandemic and that nobody wanted. And it was one of these things where we, if we rush too far past it and get right into the nitty gritty without acknowledging that, I think that would be a shame because our 
government needs to be held to account. We're having a serious financial crisis here in our nation. And from a fiscal perspective, it was a nightmare, a waste of time from all these. Now, there's a lot of things that came out of it. And we're going to talk about that. But please, let's not make let's make sure we don't rush past the fact this was a mistake by our government in, in calling an election at this time. 100%. And, you know, you have mm -hmm. to ask the question, what could we have done with $610 million, you know, for the poor and the needy, for our seniors, for our vets, at the, for our medical systems across the provinces um, at this critical time? So what else you got there, Doug, in terms of takeaways? Well, the, the uh, one of the big ones is I, I actually am in a pretty uh, pretty favored position here right now because um, a lot of what uh, what happened was were things that I was really hoping would happen. I was actually really hoping that our that, that this liberal government would not gain a majority. Um, I just couldn't imagine what would happen to our nation if you were to just give. Uh, Justin Trudeau as prime minister, an open field to run in. Um, so holding the uh, liberal government to a minority, I believe, is a success in itself. Um, I, I, there were many Canadians who share, uh, who I share their concern as well, as to what could have happened if a, uh, a government would have been handed to Aaron O'Toole. And uh, because there were a lot of decisions that were made during the uh, the election and leading up to the election, I believe that uh, that really kind of caught the eye and, and, and gave people right, uh, you know, reason to question um, whether or not we were ready to govern. Uh, uh, things like alienating social conservatives, so obviously in the lead up to the election, and discounting the impact that uh, the PPC might have on the outcome, and and I just think that as from a from a conservative, and, and I should declare right now, I am a conservative party member, so I'm speaking freely as a member, saying as a member, I was going. That's a very odd election strategy to take a major portion of your base and set them aside during an election, hoping that they'll still come out and support you. Um, and so and so, a, a big broad big takeaway was, when you do that leading up to election, you end up exactly where you started before the election. And that's what appears to have happened. Uh, Aaron O'Toole's conservative government has hit a brick wall at 119 seats. And that is, if they want to be in the political wilderness forever, then keep alienating people leading up to elections. Yeah, that's a really good insight, Doug. And I also wanted to mention one thing that I noticed is, okay, we came out with pretty much the same result in terms of uh, House of Commons construct. You're our liberal minority, about the same amount of seats with the Conservatives, about the same amount on the balance of power with the NDP and the Bloc. But one thing uh, that we did get out of this election is a whole lot of very aggressive anti-life, anti-socially conservative values uh, and policies coming through the liberal platform. Like here you have the, the defunding or the revocation of charitable status for crisis pregnancy centers, possibly canceling some health transfer payments to the provinces for provinces that don't fund abortion in private abortion clinics. Like aggression coming through these liberal policies. Do you guys feel like that factored in at all to, to the results? I think perhaps uh, for the Liberals, they went a bridge too far. So you look at someone like Marian Monsef, who was the Minister of, uh, I think, Women and Gender Equity. Um, I can't quite usually get the cabinet minister names, uh, titles correct for the Liberal government because they change uh, quite a bit all the time. But anyway, she's aggressively pro-abortion, has been ever since she was elected in 2015, and she lost her seat in Pedro Coortha. Um, she, of course, is a famous uh, My Taliban Brothers uh, quote. And unfortunately, her for her, her Taliban brothers couldn't come and save her in that rotting. So that's an example of a um, of a of a liberal member of parliament that has an extreme pro-abortion position that's not shared by the vast majority of Canadians, uh, starting to lose. An interesting thing about that uh, liberal policy when it comes to revocation and charitable status is it talks about charities that uh, provide misinformation. Uh, regarding abortion. And so um, that would probably apply to most uh, churches. It would probably apply to a lot of mosques, gurdwaras, temples, synagogues. Um, so it's very, very, very pervasive. Um, and it's not just, uh, I know it mentions crisis pregnancy centers in that liberal platform, but it, it, it goes beyond that. So usually what the liberals uh, put that stuff in there for 
isn't so much that they want to do anything per se with abortion because they basically have everything that they want. What they're trying to do is create a wedge internally within the Conservative Party during an election campaign. So if they come out with an aggressive pro-abortion policy, they know that if the Conservative leader and the leadership team either adopts it or doesn't go hard after it, that the good chunk of the Conservative voter and donor base is going to be disappointed by that, which I think we all were, that Aaron O'Toole and his team didn't even bother mentioning that. Like churches and synagogues and mosques and other religious institutions were directly, directly affected by this uh, policy that the liberals want to put in, and they had nothing to say about it. Like I cannot think of a better opportunity for the Conservative Party of Canada to actually politically engage um, organizations that otherwise do, don't get engaged because they're scared of losing their charitable status. Um, huge, huge missed opportunity. So I think it did, Fatine, affect the results, both for the Liberals and that mm. it probably kept them a little bit further away from a majority. And at the same time, it affected the Conservatives because they could have won more seats and they didn't because of these missed opportunities. Yeah, it's not hard to defend somebody who's giving free diapers and free pablum to single moms in need and in crisis. That that was that was an easy defense to pick up for sure. Um, so we'll see how all this stuff plays out in the days ahead. But as Scott, we know, and Doug knows this too, you're the numbers guy here. You're the ones that is always uh, crunching these things up, looking at things. Um, any big surprises from your vantage point? I know a lot of the mail-in ballots are still being counted, still coming in, but yeah. big surprises, uh, things that caught you off guard a little bit what, what are some of your reflections there well yeah thanks for putting that caveat in there f18 and i just want to let folks know at home so during this election there were no rules that changed no laws were changed we've had in this country for over 30 years now the ability to request it was called a special ballot a mail-in ballot and because of certain covid 19 restrictions and people's apprehension there was about a million uh mail-in ballots requested which was about 20 percent of what uh elections canada expected it would be they're expecting five million so you're talking about three thousand ballots on average per rotting of course it's not that's not a hard and fast rule some are more some are less so it's really difficult for me or anyone for that matter to go in and do a deep dive on the numbers uh at this point but we do have some preliminary numbers and we do generally know what the result is going to be which is an increased liberal uh, minority. So basically, the seat count is more or less the same. Um, but I, I was actually quite surprised at how poorly the Conservatives did in urban Canada. So in Canada's three largest cities, in Vancouver, in Toronto, and in Montreal, uh, the Conservatives essentially made no gains. In fact, they had losses. So the whole point for the last, I don't know, what, eight months, 10 months that the uh, Aaron O'Toole leadership team has been telling people is, we're going to attack to the center. We're going to go attack left. And by doing that, we're going to see a decrease in Western Canada in votes, maybe a couple seats here and there. And we're going to see these big, huge gains in Quebec and Ontario. Well, what happened was you have uh, people like Candace Bergen, who had a 20% drop in her riding in Portage Lisbon that went to uh, the PPC. You had a loss of eight seats across Western Canada, including all the seats in urban Vancouver, some of whom, actually all of whom, unfortunately, were pro-life. And uh, if even you take in those four ridings, like two-thirds of that PPC vote and put it back into the conservative column, uh, you would have had four wins there. And then okay, you so look let me just interject for a second. So here we're talking about Nellie Shin uh, in Port Coquitlam. We're talking Port about Tamara. Tamara Jansen, Cloverdale, Langley City, Alice Wong, Richmond Center. And then the other Richmond seat being Kenny Chu in Stevenson, Richmond East. None of these candidates lost by huge margins, very, very small margins. And if you take, you know, just a portion of that PPC vote and put it back into the conservative column in those four ridings, they would have won those ridings, not by huge margins. They didn't win by huge margins last time because they are swing ridings. That is the nature of swing ridings. Uh, but they would have retained it. I know speaking to a number of candidates uh, and campaigns, including some in the Vancouver area, and this generally goes uh, this is generally true across Canada, whether it's urban Canada, rural Canada, Quebec, otherwise. I had so many candidates tell me, Doug and Fateen, and their door knockers during this campaign, that, that when they were door knocking uh, to get out the vote for advance polls, so they're door knocking people who told them like three weeks prior to that that they were voting conservative, knock on their doors, encourage them to go out and vote conservative. 10% of those people in those databases told them they were voting PPC. So the bleed was real. And we knew well before election night that the bleed would be there. Um, 
and in and, and in uh, urban Canada, you had uh, margins where the Liberals won by even a larger margin on a lot of those seats in the GTA compared to Andrew Scheer in 2019. You lost two seats in the GTA. Leona Oslov, who's pro-abortion anyway, Bob Soroya, who, who didn't even have a PPC candidate in his riding. Like the, the Conservatives just didn't show up. And speaking about Conservatives that didn't show up, Aaron O'Toole won almost a million votes fewer than Andrew Scheer did in 2019. I mean, we can get into that a little bit later, but that was the biggest surprise to me for 18 was, you know, that was the sales pitch from Aaron O'Toole and his leadership team that they were going to win all these seats in Quebec and urban Canada. They lose four in uh, Vancouver. They uh, net lose one um, in, or lost two, pardon me, in the GTA. Didn't gain anything in Quebec. Quebec and Ontario altogether, the total seat gain was one and they lose eight in Western Canada. So you're you're already well behind, and we're getting and we'll get into that a little bit later, I suppose. But that was the biggest that was the biggest shocker to me was how poorly they did in urban Canada. Wow, 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 Doug, why don't you weigh in here? Any surprises uh, from your uh, analysis? Well, just to uh, just to sort of expand on on some of the things that Scott was saying is, is that when a, when a uh, uh, political party um, lays out a vision for a campaign for uh, a federal election campaign, um, their hope is, is is their their message resonates with the people that they're talking to. They're they're trying to make c- connection with the voter and establish a relationship over a period of time so that they'll commit to come out and vote for them uh, on election day. And and what we witnessed here, I believe, is and 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 focusing really because I think the biggest story is the conservative party. Failure. I mean, I don't. I, I'm obviously you can spend all day talking about the uh, NDP and the, the the you know the crashing of the Green Party and all that. But to be honest with you, none of that makes a hill of difference anyway. But the but the failure of the Conservative Party to actually connect with voters it, it was astounding to me, and the tone deafness of the campaign um, to hear back. I mean, Scott said one thing. He said he said we knew a long time ahead of E-Day that the PPC bleed was real, yet the federal uh, election, in the national campaign for the Conservative Party of Canada didn't pick up on it until three days before E-Day when they started going, hey, a vote for, you know, they, like the scramble message was, you know, a vote for the PPC is a vote for supporting Justin Trudeau. I mean, that's if that's the best you can do is come up with that line three days before the election, that, that, that's a real concern. That's a misread. And so there's a level of, there's a level of, of incompetence that you can judge the national campaign and the leader on. Yeah. I mean, Hey, you, the leader owns it all, right? I mean, the, the, we, this is this is regrettably where the conservative party, you know, the hard conversation they've got to have over their kitchen table is, is did our leader fail so bad that it's time to make a change. And that's a conversation that the members are going to have about that. But it really appears to be a combination of incompetence, tone deafness, and and just just a, 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 a again, following this presumption that the support that they need to win a majority government in this country is going to come from the middle left spec side of the political spectrum. That is not where the coalition is going to be built to to form this governing alternative to the liberals. The coalition is going to be a big tent coalition, broad base across the right side of the spectrum up to the center. That's where it's going to come from. And that's the the strategy that Stephen Harper used and uh, and to build his big tent coalition and which which turned out to be quite successful over many years. But just, uh, you know, ignoring an entire segment of your population during an election cycle and 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 pretending you're 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 uh, you don't have the challenges you have with the PPC that's a problem we, we I really really believe that it needs to be acknowledged as a huge mistake it went, it went a little bit beyond that too uh Doug like it wasn't just like an, it, ignoring let's say the the pro-lifers social conservatives in general um but, but even uh, other uh issue-based groups that that we might not really run in the same circles like uh gun rights groups um um, civil liberties groups when it comes to vaccine passports, uh, the carbon tax Paris federation for carbon taxes, yeah. Western based organizations. It wasn't just an, a, ignoring them. It was almost like there was an active disdain for those people. Like they don't want us in the party. They don't want us in their base. And 
and the, the, the Conservative Party in Canada, in my estimation, is, is a fairly united party, right? Like most of the 6 million people, well, not 6 million anymore, thanks to Aaron O'Toole and his leadership team, but most of like the five plus million people that donate and vote for the Conservative Party of Canada are generally, you know, s- somewhere I would say on the pro-life spectrum, like a- a- at least softly pro-life. Um, you know, they, they, they want fiscal responsibility. They want a strong military. They want safe uh, criminal legislation to protect families and neighborhoods, things of this nature. Like the, that, that's fairly universal within the Conservative Party of Canada. It's, it's a fairly homogenous. The deep chasm that exists in the Conservative Party of Canada isn't amongst those, you know, five million plus uh, donors and voters. The deep chasm is between all those five million people and the two hundred full time staffers that live and work in Ottawa, in uh, party headquarters, uh, certain MPs, um, high profile MPs' offices and in the office of leader of the opposition. And that's what needs to be removed. Like how many uh, uh, pro-lifers and social conservatives are on the leader's communications team? You know, is it is it 40% of his communications team pro-life? Because it should be, because that reflects what the voting and donor coalition is. Um, you know, how many pro-lifers are part of the policy team? How many pro-lifers are part of um, all the uh, regional directors for the conservative party that deal with AGMs and uh and nomination meetings and things of this nature. So um, it, when, you, when you actively ha- disdain your base and abandon your base, your base is going to abandon you, which they did during the election. And now they're going to probably leading up to some of these very serious leadership questions over the next uh, coming weeks and months. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're onto something there, Scott. You know, I heard over and over people saying like, we're tired of the Conservative Party just assuming on our vote or taking us for granted, taking our donations, taking our volunteer time, but not really taking our hearts seriously on on the issues we care about. The other thing too is the Libertarians, right? You know, Max himself is a Libertarian. So just (laughs) anyone that was feeling uncomfortable with the strong government clampdowns here over the last two years that have so profoundly impacted all of our lives. I know here, uh, Rob and I haven't seen our mother-in-law for a year and a half. I haven't seen my family for almost two years now. And who knows when that next moment will be. And so I think people are just fatigued with with the government assertion with the management of the uh, pandemic because of uh, how weak our healthcare system has been across the board to handle um, ICU beds um, or with ICU beds. And so you have that dynamic as well, where people are just fatigued with with this oppressive government um, style of governing, which Trudeau exudes, but also which O'Toole wasn't really pushing back against either. I think people are looking for a hero. People on the right are looking for a hero, but also people who just don't like the taste of socialism are looking for a hero as well. I don't know if you agree with that or not. Well, like I, I think, like when you campaign to on policy, at the very least, to to have as little daylight between yourself and and the liberals. What what Doug was saying, you know, in the dying days of the campaign, which is too late at that point anyway, because things are the, the cement is starting to dry, so to speak. And they're saying, oh, you know, don't vote PPC, a vote for PPC, or vote for another party, or just staying home as a vote for Justin Trudeau. Well, I'm sorry, but for the last you know eight months, you've been telling me how much you are like Justin Trudeau. So why, like, what is the difference? What is the motivation? Either you get Justin Trudeau or Justin Trudeau Jr. Like, it doesn't make a difference to me. Uh, and the other thing, personally, for me, like, if I have to t- choose between bubbling fool of a drama teacher who couldn't even implement his liberal policies while having a majority in both the House of Commons and Senate versus a man with military background that's telling me that he's going to implement liberal policies with even more efficiency and effectiveness with military precision, I will always take the former over the latter a thousand days out of 10. And I think a lot of conservatives felt that way. um, And that was reflected in their votes. And that's why Aaron O'Toole and the leadership team around him lost almost a million votes in the last two months or two years. Yeah, and, and this is interesting because uh, you're talking about the the differences between the two party leaders. Uh, so many people during the election cycle and leading up to the election expressed to me a concern for like usually you don't you don't actually uh, have concern over oh I hope we don't win or what if we win I mean this would like if if the if the conservative party wins 
that's a problem. You know, you go, my goodness, if we're worried about winning, then we know we've got something structurally uh, uh, broken or damaged or some, the wheels coming off the cart somewhere uh, when, when really we should be focused on, again, pr pr providing for Canadians that unified governing alternative to what we're already uh, experiencing and defining ourselves well enough to, and of course, when I say defining ourselves, I'm talking about taking into full consideration the impact of the the d divisive us uh, side. Like we have a challenge when we've got the uh, PPC and the and Derek Sloan's new party, and of course, there's that Elevation Party, and I, I, you know, they're all everyone's everyone's sort of splintered on the right. We've got to be dealing with these real challenges that we have as we present ourselves during election time to the, to the, uh, the, the, the electorate and say, we are your unified governing alternative to what's already out there. And I don't think they did a very good job of that, uh, uh, dealing with those realities and communicating to the public. Yeah, good points all around. And, you know, the beauty of democracy is this whole thing known as checks and balances, right? I don't think any of us are interested in having all of our significant political parties with seats in the House of Commons on the left. We need a true unified conservative alternative, I think, is the big takeaway that everybody is resonating with. Um, any other surprises or things that really caught your attention? Like, what about we? The are the conservatives lost a lot of seats in Western Canada? I think you said uh, it's looking like about eight at this point, but there were pickups in Atlantic Canada. What was that about? Yeah, we actually saw uh, at the beginning of the night, the conservatives were having a pretty good night in Atlantic Canada. At one point, it looked like they might pick up something like uh, six, seven, eight seats in the line of Canada. It, it looks like at the end of the day, they'll pick up three. So uh, Jake Stewart and Miramichi Grand Lake, um, you have uh, Stephen Ellison, Cumberland Colchester, and then you have Rick Perkins and South Shore St. Margaret. So you have one more in New Brunswick. That was a tight race last time in, in 2019, and it was a riding that's historically conservative, uh, federally as well as provincially. And then you have in rural Nova Scotia, uh, of course, if we recall at the beginning of the election campaign, the federal one, uh, Nova Scotians were ending their provincial campaign, and they went from a liberal majority to a conservative majority in that province. And so I think you saw uh, some of the after effects of that in, in rural Nova Scotia there. Um, I know that on election night, one of my favorite things uh, that night in our live stream was I got to call that the very first uh, conservative MP that was called by the media of winning his seat was none other than our good friend, Richard Bragdon, uh, who is 100% pro-life voting record, great guy. Uh, he, he, he ran a tight race and unfortunately barely lost in 2015. He won that seat with, I would say, great numerical authority in 2019, and he just built upon that. Um, he has the highest uh, margin, I believe, of any conservative member of parliament in Atlanta, Canada, maybe even uh, east of Ontario. I have to wait for the numbers to come in, uh, the, the final numbers to come in to, to check that. So, you know, the, the Conservatives had a, had a pretty good night in Atlanta, Canada. They, they might win uh, an, an extra fourth riding in Atlanta, Canada on uh, the island of Newfoundland on the rock there and uh, Costa Bay's uh, Notre Dame de Grasse. Um, but uh, we're waiting for the mail-in ballot. So right now, the uh, candidate there, the Conservative candidate, Clifford Small, is leading by about 500 votes. I believe there are 2,000 mail-in ballots to come in. Most polling firms show that uh, for most uh, uh, provinces and territories, uh, according to their polls for the million people that were voting by mail-in ballots, about 47% to 53% are voting or tending to vote liberal and you only have about maybe 18 to 20 percent that are voting conservative so that will be a tight riding once those mail-in ballots are counted up and that will probably switch back to the liberals the conservatives might hang on but you know it was a good night in Atlanta Canada um but those gains in Atlanta Canada I uh, can't make up for the zero gains more or less in Quebec and Ontario and the losses that were experienced uh out in the prairies and in Vancouver unfortunately. Uh, one other highlight, if I can mention, is uh, our good friend Luzin Lewis, of course, uh, who ran for the leadership uh, last time, the one that Aaron O'Toole won uh, almost a year ago, actually, now that we think of it, uh, a year and a month ago. Um, and she she won her riding in Helmand, Norfolk, which is great. Now she's going to be in the House of Commons, finally. And uh, Faye Teen, you were telling me, and I double-checked, and yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. 
she had the highest number of votes ever cast for a candidate in that riding's history. So yeah. congratulations to our friend, uh, Leslin. It's so great to have her in the house. I'm super excited to see her there uh, in question period in committee. I think she's going to be a great member of parliament. And I know talking to other uh, candidates and members of parliament, they were very, very excited uh, to see Leslin in the house. So um, yeah. the, the one last thing I will mention in terms of uh, and numbers and some surprises and perhaps some good news, Fate team, maybe some good news would be good to talk about, is uh, a bunch of our organizations got together over the past few months and we identified uh, some pro-life members of parliament that were maybe in some tight swing ridings. You know, yeah. it, it, was a, it was a difficult election for most conservatives. I think most conservative candidates out there would say that was a difficult election. At least that's what I'm hearing from the ground. And so we want to make sure that these, we identified 16, that these 16 pro-life members of parliament running for re-election, these tight swing ridings, had the resources necessary so that they could secure re-election. And I'm happy to say that 13 of the 16, which is a good high percentage, right? That's over three quarters, uh, won re-election. So, so we have, our efforts uh, were not for vain. They were very fruitful. It's really great to have those people back in there. Of course, you know, we're, we're losing a couple of pro-lifers. We're gaining a couple of pro-lifers. So, so at the end of the day, I have to do that analysis. But it looks like um, while the conservatives lost overall, we probably re retain the number, same number of pro-lifers in the House of Commons, which I like to say is very good news, especially coming out of a tough election night like that. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And correct me if I'm wrong, are the three that were lost, those three that we mentioned earlier in our chat here in British Columbia? All three were in uh, British Columbia. And again, by very, very small margins. Um, I, one other thing that I, I heard from complaints from in, in the new Canadian and immigrant communities is that the Conservative Party in this election didn't really have much of a reach out uh, to them. Uh, not much in their platform, not much in terms of tour. There wasn't much of a tour anyway. Um, and, and there was nothing that, that, um, that the party really did to reach out to them. I know that leading up to uh, the election uh, a few months beforehand, Andrew Scheer did five big policy announcements, uh, kind of broad strokes, and did five big speeches. And one of them was on uh, immigration. So, kind of picking up on the themes of Jason Kenney uh, when he was a minister in the Harper government. There really wasn't any of that here in 2021. And I think that is one of the reasons why you saw um, four losses in the city of Vancouver, as well as losses in the GTA, especially in ridings where you had a higher uh, East Asian and Chinese population. So um, there's another side effect of uh, Aaron O'Toole's leadership in the last election. It, in addition to the party being less urban and less suburban, it's also unfortunately now in terms of their caucus, less ethnic, ethnically diverse as well. Hmm. Well, this is also fascinating. I'm sure we're going to be continuing to chop it up from every angle here in, in the weeks ahead. So many more conversations to be had. Interesting, though, that uh, in British Columbia, you know, if you're looking at things from a, a pro-life, pro-family perspective, that's where the real heartbreakers were. But in Atlantic Canada, I guess I'm a bit biased because this is our our home now here in New Brunswick. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think most of, I think pretty much all the wins in Atlantic Canada were strong value-based candidates, people that have been willing to, that, that voted with Kathy Wagenthal on her gender side bill and have been willing to take a stand on some key issues that that conservatives care about. We'll see about the new candidates. You know, they still have their track record ahead of them. But, you know, some interesting analytics there. But let me ask you guys this question. So in the next couple of weeks, you know, there's going to be so much conversation about where the conservative movement goes from here. And when I say conservative movement, I don't mean in a partisan sense, just those that are the center and center right part of the political spectrum. What are the conversation points that you guys are going to be looking for in here, here in the next couple of weeks? Well, if I if I may, the, uh, the 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 of course we're always going to be um, doing the forensic review of what went wrong. I mean, that's the, the elections sort of drift in that direction. When they're over, you go, okay, where did we miss the the mark here, and how could we do better? But but really, I think that it's an opportunity for us now, and this is following up on on something that both of you have been talking about. Is is that we have some great successes and some fantastic examples 
of where people have faith have entered the public square and have effectively communicated their positions, their views. They've they've expressed themselves. Their values have been clear. That's they're they're not. They have no hidden agenda. They're not trying to pretend to be people. They're not the people like Richard Bragdon. That is that fella is one of the most open and straightforward guys around that you'll ever meet. Leslie Lewis just just doing so well in her election. We need to be shining bright lights on on not only their wins but the road to their victories because they have done things here that are duplicatable and they're they're definitely once once one person pr- does something i believe that it, if it's proved up if one person can do it we can all do it so let's just all jump on and look for those candidates who we believe are willing at least willing to represent our views and values and say let's Let's take a look at the Leslie Lewis campaign. Let's look at, at how effectively she communicates her pro-life views. Let's take a look at Richard Bragg and how is it that he builds relationships mm-hmm. as effectively as he does? And that's, by the way, Richard Bragdon's like, uh, you know, that is his secret weapon. That guy, if you ever look him in the eye, you are his friend within 30 seconds. The <laughs> yeah, guy everybody did, loves Richard Bragdon. Oh, yeah. Sure. I mean, he just did. And this is a former pastor. You know, and 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 I can mention, by the way, I can mention these names because I feel comfortable doing that because they both are able to handle themselves. Because oftentimes when we mention names, we sometimes paint bullseyes on them, and and people, you know, like leftists kind of kind of target them. But I'm talking about our ability to duplicate what worked during this election and prepare for the next election. But there's two things we need to do. One is, is we need to make sure we have a leader in place in the Conservative Party of Canada that's willing that's willing to, to have that happen and is willing to support those candidates. And the second thing is, we need strong representation on the ground. And that's why continuing to do our work, Fatine and Scott, working on the EDA strategies of putting people in place on the ground, in the ridings, where we believe there, we have uh, winnable opportunities, get the right candidates nominated, and working the system, working within the system uh, to uh, to prepare for the next opportunity that we're going to have, because we're going to have one. We're, believe me, that's one thing about Canada. It's great. There's always another election down the road, and there's another opportunity always to select new leadership and to f- start fresh. So that's that's what I'm looking for at, forward to ahead. I want to go back to those, something that Scott said earlier about how there isn't necessarily, and I thought this was so fascinating, Scott, how you put it, that there isn't necessarily a divide in the Conservative mm-hmm. Party base, but there's a divide between, what did you say, the 5 million uh, Conservatives in Canada and the 200 staffers that, um, you know, and I, I want to say this, I guess this is the time to say it, that I, I watched a lot of the nominations close up. And let's just say there was a hostility mm-hmm. uh, that came um, towards uh, pro-life, pro-family, uh, those that would be center and center right on the spectrum within the Conservative Party that were putting their names forward for nomination. Uh, no names mentioned, but let's just say that I could probably state about half a dozen direct situations. Now, those people that experienced that animosity from the party, they weren't experiencing it from the party base. They were experiencing it from the party staffers, right? Mm -hmm. And so in this whole analysis about what went right, what went wrong, do you think that needs to be a part of the conversation that maybe this isn't just about Aaron O'Toole, but maybe this is about the, the culture and the influencers that set the tonality for these key moments. And now we see that the tonality that was set was a loser, not a winner for the Conservative Party. Does, this, th- does that need to be a part of the conversation here? 100%. And it, it, they're just doing the same thing over and over again. Like if you, Since the party was formed, they've contested, uh, I think, almost seven elections now, right? So we have 2004. 2006, 2008, 2011, 2015, 2019, 2021, right? Seven elections. Seven elections the party has contested. They won majority once. Now, winning a majority in this country at this particular point in time, and I said this in our live stream the other night, it's a difficult task, right? Even the liberals are having a difficult time of winning a majority. They haven't won a majority since 2000 prior to uh, 2015. So in the last, you know, 21 years, they've won two, we've won one. So it's it's not like they're 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 killing the conservatives at winning majorities. It's, it's a difficult thing to do. But that being said, um, there, there, is, there, is, there is a pathway forward 
Um, I wouldn't say that Harper Coalition for 2011 is, is the same thing that they should be doing in, in 2021 or in 2023 or whenever the next election is going to be. Um, but, but there is a bit of a pathway forward. And they, they just don't seem interested that those 200 staffers are going down that path. Uh, they seem to be stuck in their own little uh, bubble. Um, they don't really share the same, well, they don't really, they don't, period. They don't share the same values. They don't share the same principles as the vast majority of those 5 million plus uh, Canadians that donate and vote for the Conservative Party of Canada. And that's a real problem. So when we're talking leadership about a potential leadership review and, and caucus will take uh, care of that if, if need be, if they so decide. And if not, there's there's other opportunities um, through the membership and uh, at the party policy convention where there has to be a leadership review. Um, so the, 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 those opportunities will come. But should they come and you replace the leader, um, uh, which hopefully we can get a really great leader, as Doug was saying, it's not just replacing the leader. We also have to look at those regional organizers that you were talking about, Fateen, mm -hmm. right? Right across uh, um, Canada, all the provinces and territories. Are they actually representative and do they share the same values and do they share the same principles of the people that they're supposed to be serving uh, party members in those ridings, in those regions, right? Uh, we have to take a look at, you know, the executive director. We have to take a look at who's on the board of directors for the Conservative Fund of Canada. That's that's the legal entity that actually hires people for the party that, that runs the money and, and takes care of finances. We have to look at people who are in the OLO, the policy team, the communications team, the stakeholders team. I'm sorry, but like our organizations are some of the largest and most active, both in terms of volunteers and donors stakeholders for the Conservative Party of Canada. And I don't know about you two, but I was not reached out from the Aaron O'Toole leadership campaign about, you know, what we would like to see in the policy platform or anything like that. I'm sure they've reached out to the Chambers of Commerce. I'm sure they've reached out to uh, different, you know, industry groups and, and uh, the LGBT uh, groups. And, and that's all well and fine that they do that. But it's not that they shouldn't do that, but they're not reaching out to us, as far as I know. Um, and we're like the biggest block of the Conservative Party. So what's up with that? So you're right, Fateen. There needs to be an exorcism with a, oh, there needs to be an exorcism amongst the staff full time who work for Party HQ and who work for the OLO. And I think a lot of them, maybe even the majority, need to be dismissed. And thank you for your service over the years. But what you are providing to the party is clearly not working. And for the good of the party, and frankly, for the good of the country, you need to go. Well, I, and I appreciate the point that you make that those that serve in the infrastructure should be reflecting the base. So let's look at what happened at the Conservative Convention. Let's look at the main themes. Let's look at the policies that passed with that 85 to 95 percent percentile. And that is a reflection of the true heart of the party and the staffing, the infrastructure needs to honor and serve that because this isn't a dictatorship. It's a democracy, right? So, OK, I get to ask the, the controversial question, though. Uh, is this the time just to, to wash your hands of the Conservative Party? Is this the time for a purple exodus? PPC got 10 percent in this last election. Heck, maybe they could pull, pull a few seats out in the next one. Um, what is your response to that, That to people that are just saying, I, I have no faith in the Conservative Party at all. I'm going, I'm, you know, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, happy to take that question because, uh, as you know, uh, Fatine and Scott, I have been a uh, Conservative Party member since day one, was on the uh, National Council that uh, voted to merge the Canadian Alliance with the Progressive Conservative Party before. And and so uh, and so I have I've, I've seen this party's uh, uh, transition over the years uh, from what the original vision was to where it is now. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm married to the party at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, my days of idolizing politics, political figures, political parties is long past. I've taken off those rose-colored glasses. But I recognize that a political party is merely a shell and so when somebody says the political party of the Conservative Party of Canada has broken and it's got all of these problems, I just go, OK, great. What, which people do you want to put in the places that are going to change the party then? Because like Scott mentioned, we have uh, the uh, the leaders position. We have uh, EDAs on the ground. Uh, we have uh, staff in the OLO. We have all uh, these conservative fund. We have lots of people that we can put in place and we certainly know how to do it. This is the one great thing about it is 
I hang around people like you. We all collectively know how to replace all of these people, uh, but we need the, the the really the critical mass of members and participation from citizens who share our views and values. That's why, right for the for the for the majority of the last five years, we have been in our organization coalition building. We are rallying people around the things that we believe in because we're looking for opportunities like fixing the Conservative Party of Canada uh, by, by and, and moving as one mass massive force into that party and correcting a lot of the challenges. Now, people might say, well, how come the Conservative Party? Why not the PPC? Well, the reality is, again, these are political realities. I'm not, I'm not just, you know, favoring the Conservative Party because I'm a member of it. No, the PPC has no infrastructure. This is a party that that basically has no no EDAs on the ground. They're, they they are a, a movement that needs to build a party under it. And we can take all of that time and do all of that and build a whole new party, or we can take the one that we've already got sitting in front of us and just transform it into something that better represents the views and values of the majority of Canadians. Because I really do believe that, that our views and values are the views and values of the majority of Canadians. Yeah, and, and like, okay, I'll get right down to brass tacks, right? So my job at right now is to elect as many pro-lifers to our federal and provincial legislatures as quickly as humanly possible so that we begin to pass pro-life legislation to reduce the abortion and assisted suicide rates. That's my job. That's what a lot of people that are going to be watching this fake team uh, pay me to do. And I have a fiduciary responsibility to our board of directors and to our donors to ensure that that happens. And I know that uh, the frustration shared and expressed that the Conservative Party of Canada is palpable these days. And I share that frustration and I am uh, <laughs> I, I probably more so than most people watching this. I share that frustration because it's day in, day out for me uh, dealing with these people that we were talking about earlier. The party is more than just the leader. The party is more than just those 200 staffers. The party is all those people I talked about, all those voters, all those volunteers, all those donors. That is the party, right? And what has to happen is those EDAs and those in the National Council, the candidates, the leader, and the staff have to be representative of the party, not vice versa. And so I think when you look at the numbers, and again, I'm just going based on facts, right? That is all we can operate in. We have to operate in the realm of facts and not in the realm of fantasy. The facts of the matter are that you know, when you look at Derek Sloan, he couldn't get his new party started up. It doesn't exist with Elections Canada. It's not an actual thing. He chose his own riding to run in, which is Banff Airdrie, and got less than 5% of the vote. I think it was around 2%. Mm -hmm. So, like, that is not an actual viable vehicle in order to pass, get people elected to pass legislation to save babies' lives and the elderly lives through reducing the abortion and assisted suicide rates. You look at the People's Party of Canada. Yes, they did far better than they did last time. Still well less than 10%, 5.1, 5.2% across the country. I mean, they did very well in some ridings. They did poorly in a number of other ridings. They didn't win any seats. There is no path forward to show that they're going to win any seats um, or that they were even close to winning any seats in this in their second election, right? A lot of them like to, uh, people like to compare the PPC to the Reform Party of old. Well, by the second election rolled around for the Reform Party, granted there was a five-year window as opposed to a two-year window, and Doug, you'll be able to remember uh, this coming from the Canadian Alliance wing, they went from 2.9% in the 1988 election to well over 20%, winning you know well over 50 seats in the 1993 election. That is not what has happened. That has not what's happened with the PPC. We were able to interview lots of PPC candidates this time who are pro-life. Lovely people, very, very thoughtful people. Would love to see a good number of them be elected to the House of Commons. Running for the PPC, pardon me, running for the PPC is not a viable alternative at this particular point in time to running for the Conservatives. Um, I know a lot of those good PPC candidates were uh, blocked uh, by the Conservative Party of Canada, and that's what you're talking about, Fateen, dealing with a lot of those staffers. And I can understand their frustration in, in not wanting to be involved in the party again. But, you know, when you're asking, like, do we throw up our hands and walk away? No, the answer is leaning in. Yeah. The fact that they have to disqualify candidates for spurious reasons, the fact that they have to get the leader to say, oh, you know, vote for me so we can stop Justin Trudeau. The fact that they have to be so heavy-handed with us and try to ignore us is because we're winning. 
because we're winning more and more people on national council. We're getting the official policy book to be more and more pro-life. We're getting the constitution of the party to be more uh, grassroots friendly toward us because we have the numbers. And we're becoming more and more competitive in leadership races. You know, for the last two leadership races, for our organization's perspective, you know, we were able to crown the king, so to speak. I think for the next leadership race, we're going to be able to crown the king himself or the queen herself. Um, and I think we're going to be able to do it directly. So the answer isn't to walk away. The answer is to lean in, take your rightful place, as Doug likes to say, and make this party your own because it is our party. Not theirs, it's ours. Well yeah, said. that's the beauty of the beauty of democracy, and and a lot could change here, right? Like just like like you said, it was a year ago that we were in a leadership race. Look at everything that's happened in the next year, and who knows if there if there won't be a leadership review that comes out of this. We might be in the midst of another leadership race sometime soon within the Conservative Party. There might be somebody who's uh, crowned, you know, as you just use that analogy, and perhaps somebody that could unite the right, that could mm -hmm. go to Bernier and say, hey, come on, for the sake of the nation, for the sake of these values of faith, family, freedom, and fiscal stewardship, let's, let's kind of hug and make up, you know, let's hug it out here and, and let's move forward. And that would be, that would be an amazing testimony, actually. But I do want to say one last thing here, because, you know, I've heard it said that politics is is a sport and it can get feisty and nasty and there's a lot of passion and there's a lot of strategy and and um, it, it can it can feel like it has that bite. Right. And this is one of those moments where emotions are high and opinions are high. I just want to encourage those of you that are watching this right now just to remember that we're dealing with people that Aaron O'Toole is is a man, is a is a human, and and Rebecca, his beautiful wife, is a is a a, a real person, and their children are real people. And I remember how much um, Andrew went through, you know, and his family, and just the ferocity and the vitriol that was kind of directed at them after the last election. And let's just remember to keep our kindness on and let's, mm. you know, if you're a person of prayer watching this, be praying for Aaron O'Toole, be praying for those staffers. Obviously, we want the best result for the sake of our nation, for the sake Amen. of our children. But let's remember that we're dealing with people that, that have hearts. And, you know, let's be praying for, for Tamara Jansen and mm. for, um, for those that have put so much on the line, that, that paid such a huge price in the last couple of years here um, and in the last few months. And so let's keep our humanity on <laughs> and stuff. And that, I'm not directing that in any way at, at Scott or Doug, because you guys oh. are, are so statesmanly and, and, and amazing at uh, conducting yourself in these prickly seasons. But for all of us, let's just keep our love on and uh, exhibit a type of conservatism that, that has that value as well of kindness. So um, that Good doesn't mean point. we can't be strong. Good point, Faitine. I need to ask this question here. Um, Justin Trudeau did not get the popular vote uh, two elections in a row and yet continues to get the number of seats to enable him to form a minority government. I am hearing massive dissatisfaction around this repeated dynamic. Is it time for widespread electoral reform? You go ahead, Doug. <laughs> yeah, I, we both sort of take a deep breath. That, yeah. <laughs> it, it, now, that that's a question. I mean, if, if there was this groundswell of citizen support for electoral reform, then, uh, then, then you know, I, I, I think that that would be a question that we could talk about. But unfortunately, they did a, an inquiry into electoral reform as a liberal government, and it was nothing but a uh, sham. I mean, they were sham meetings. They were being managed poorly. They were, you know, the, the information they were gathering was being contaminated right at source. I mean, it was just a, it, 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 they were trying to drum up citizen interest in electoral reform and they couldn't even get it done then so uh i mean if there was one i guess but right now there's not there there just does not seem to be scott unless i'm i have my ear to the wrong track uh i'm i am hearing not a great amount of support for electoral reform yeah i just don't think it's realistic i just don't think it's going to happen I, I think there's been about a half dozen referenda uh, provincially in this country in the last 20 years a couple in bc prince edward island um, Ontario even, and every single time that there is a referendum on should we change the system and should we change it to this or that or should we just change it in general, um, massive majorities of, of Canadians in those provinces have said no. 
So, you know, they, they like the idea of electoral reform. Those who do like the idea of electoral reform can't even agree on which form of electoral reform there should be. And so um, most, well, no, I shouldn't say most, but uh, a lot of countries out there do have first past the post, particularly for those that were part of the British Empire. So, uh, you know, Canada, the United States, the United Kingdom. Um, it, it has been a tradition for quite a number of centuries. I, I just don't really see it going away anytime soon. It will require constitutional changes, um, which is very difficult to, to get done in this country. Um, so, yeah, I, I just... You, we, we know we know what it looks like, right? We, we know how where the votes are. We know where the seats are. We know what the efficiency is. We know what the margins are. It's not hard to form government in this country, whether you're conservative or liberal. I would say it's hard to form a majority government, but it's not hard to form government. I mean, the, the early analysis is that, um, and we again, we have to wait for the final numbers, but the early analysis is that the conservatives lost 24 seats because of the split with the PPC. And I think that assumes 100%. So, but even with like, you know, two thirds or 75% of the PPC vote going back to the conservative column, um, they would have won at least 20 more seats, right? So now you're taking 20 seats away from the Liberals. So they go down to 138. You're adding 20 to the conservatives. You go to 139. There you have your one seat advantage. So it's not hard in this country for those two parties to form government. It is hard to form a majority government. We know where the votes are. We know where the seats are. We know where the margins are. We know what the game is. So let's go play the game. Final words, you guys, as we begin to kind of wrap this this Facebook and YouTube live down. Yeah, lots of my my last word is uh, let's let's just keep an eye on the horizon. Let's keep looking for those opportunities where we can have influence and where we can all work together, no matter which party you're in, no matter what it is that uh, that you believe uh, are. Are, are, are basically, you know, your ideas as the best way forward. Look look for opportunities for people around you to work with you to advance your views and values. That's my encouragement because you're going to find them. They're coming. What was it? They say crisis is this opportunity where chaos and opportunity come together. Like it's this moment in time. So if, if Canada's in a crisis situation politically, believe me, there are lots of opportunities where you can have influence on the road ahead. And all we have to do is keep our eyes open and be willing Willing to work with others. Doug, and, and the, the last thing I would say is, yeah, that there's going to be some opportunities coming up in terms of a probable leadership race, um, nomination races, things of this nature. And, you know, if, if you're out there watching this and you receive, you know, an email or a text or whatever from For My Canada or Canada Family Action or right now from, from any of our groups or some other groups asking you to get involved, maybe sell a couple of member shows, host a coffee party, uh, hop on the phone for a couple of hour, uh, hours a week and make some phone calls to uh, convince people to vote for, you know, the right candidate or something like that. Uh, hop, uh, take, take those opportunities. That, that's how we win. That's how we've won in the past. Uh, but it's also how we've come up short because we're we're, we're lacking that that uh, muscle to to take it over the top. I mean, fake team. I mean, you you've had a couple of those stories from uh, some of these nomination meetings over the past couple of months where you come so so incredibly close. Mm. And I lost by eighty six votes yeah. at the nomination level. I had just moved, went up against uh, the former mayor who everybody knew. Nine hundred people came out and voted, and I only lost by eighty six. Like that's how that's how much just showing up can can make an impact. If we would have had another two or three committed volunteers, I would have been on the ballot. Uh, and it, it, let's just say it, it would have been an interesting campaign to watch. I think. <laughs> so anyway. Yeah, so like, like, there's gonna be coming. Like, if you if you're out there, you're sitting there, and you're like, oh, you know, I don't really like Aaron O'Toole, or I didn't like my conservative candidate in my riding last time. Well, you're gonna eventually have an opportunity to to replace both, maybe sooner rather than later. Who knows? We'll see. Uh, but if you don't like something, then 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 fix it, right? And if uh, you, if you're temporarily voting for another political party for the time being because you're waiting for that opportunity, that's fine. But but realize like you have to think with your head and not with your heart. And when it comes to politics, because it is a mathematical game, uh, we, we have to we have to look at what the best opportunity is before us in order to get the right people elected. I, I know that, uh, like, for example, Tamara Jansen's riding, I, I think uh, her campaign team was telling me there's something like four, three or four thousand people didn't even bother to show up who were in their databases identified to to vote. If she only lost that riding by, you know, 1,500 or 1,900 votes, like that would have been, like even if half those people came out to vote for her, 
uh, she would have won that riding or like, you know, a third of the people who voted for PPC in that riding, she would have won her riding. So uh, show up, but show up and be intelligent of where you're going to put not just your vote, but also your time, because we want to have the highest return on investment when we're getting involved politically uh, over these coming weeks, months and next couple of years. Yeah. Good point. Absolutely. You know, so often these losses, these close losses are not by design, they're by abdication, like you just said, just the, that little group of people that if they just would have shown up would have been the game changers. Well, well, you guys have given us so much to think about. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to the conversations going forward as we continue to dive into this and, and see how we can be more and more effective as those that want to give ourselves to building a better Canada for the future. Interesting days, to say the least. Now, Scott, on election night, you guys did live election coverage, but I want to encourage people, even though election night's over, to actually go watch that archive because you had some incredible conversations, some great guest speakers that way in. And I, I thought it was very, very eye-opening from a, a variety of tiers. So where can people find your election night coverage if they want to go check that out? Yeah, we live stream it on our Facebook page. So they can just go to our Right Now Facebook page. And it will be, uh, right now, will be the first video up there for the time being. My colleague, Alyssa, she's back from maternity leave and uh, she's our social media guru. So um, we will be doing uh, different clips of uh, different interviews we had. We had some, uh, like you said, Faitine, we had some great guests. We had some great analysis. We had some great discussion. Um, you know, it was, it was a four-hour long show. So I don't know if people want to strap in for that, especially after the fact. Uh, but over the coming uh, weeks, we'll definitely get some, you know, two, five, ten-minute clips out there for people to consume in maybe a more reasonable time. But, yeah, thanks for the shout-out. I appreciate that. It was a lot of fun. It's a lot of work. Um, it was a great crew over there uh, in the studio, um, great volunteers we had feeding in data, and uh, we had great guests, uh, and, and Alyssa, my colleague, is the one who, who really um, uh, quarterbacks that with our friend Dave LaRosse, who, who produced and, and directed it. So, um, yeah, it, 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 was, it was a lot of fun. It's, it's a lot of work on my end, uh, but not nearly as much as those people. So thanks for the shout out again. If people have time to an opportunity to take a peek at it. Uh, please do so. Yeah, it, it was really, really interesting. Feedback as well. Uh, the one the one thing I will say that there's talk of, we'll see if it happens next time, is instead of me being on my computer talking about the ridings, there's there's talk of giving me a big screen so I can oh, watch the screen and zoom in on the different ridings and, and show what's happening there. I uh, give a bit of a presentation. So we'll see if we can get to that point. Uh, but anyway, yeah, thanks, Faitine. Well, it sounds like you're hooked on this and we're glad for it. I, I want to encourage people, if you don't have time to watch the full four hours, definitely watch that conversation with Jonathan Van Maren about uh, policies in Hungary that yeah. uh, really encourage people um, towards the blessing of, ch of children. Actually, I found it very fascinating looking at some of the um, things that have been brought forward in other nations that are really powerful and supportive for families. So that was that was amazing. And so your website as well, uh, Scott, is it starts right now ca correct that's right yeah and we'll have our analysis of the election up probably sometime next week again we're just waiting for those mail-in ballots to come in there's about a million of them so i don't want to provide you know inaccurate analysis based on incomplete information so we'll have a blog post up there sometime next week for people to go through and, and we'll we'll discuss some of the things we discussed here today of you know where we made some gains where we had some losses and uh, what do the numbers uh, look like yeah, and I want to say this too. If you're not on Scott's uh, email list, it starts right now. Definitely get on their email list because they're constantly yeah. putting out great information. And another group who's constantly putting out great information is yours, Doug. You've got the National Leadership Briefing coming up. I know you're going to be continuing to train people on how they can be effective in engaging with the political sphere right where they are in their neighborhoods. When is your next uh, National Leadership Briefing call? And how can people sign up to, to participate with that? Well, the next call is on the first Friday of next month, which is October 1st. So it's uh, Friday, October 1st, and it's at 1 p.m. Eastern. You can register for that call at our website, nlbcanada.ca. That's National Leadership Briefing, nlbcanada.ca. And we would welcome you there. Join us. We are advancing principles that you share, values you have, and we're doing it as a collective, as a group of people. So we'd love to have you there. Yeah. Now, one of the things that, that Doug's group did that I thought was really good this uh, time that 
that you had that website um, that sorry, I forget the URL. You, you gave choice. Ca. Yeah, yeah, and I found that really helpful, and I guided some people over there, and uh, hopefully you're, you're able to do that next time as well. Yeah, that's the beginning. Uh, our e day choice website, uh, that was the beginning, and we're just going to keep improving upon it and improving upon it. And and so, yeah, keep an eye on that one because it's it's going to be the beginning of uh, at, the, at your fingertips. How is it that your member of parliament is performing uh, in comparison, of course, to the things that you believe in? So we want to make sure that information is always available on the road ahead. Amazing. What an incredible service. I love how everybody is just bringing their piece, doing their part. Obviously, it starts right now completely focused on the life issue. Uh, Doug, your organization is focused on the four pillars. So you're also looking at fiscal issues, at freedom issues. And then, of course, if you guys want to stay connected with us, with For My Canada, we're constantly putting out national alerts as well and coordinating with different groups like the ones just mentioned uh, to make sure we're having the best impact possible for the sake of the future of this nation. We have signed up. We are hooked. I think all three of us have bought our grave plot here in Canada. We're not going anywhere, and we're committed to making sure that things continue to get better and brighter. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank you, Doug, for joining me today, and let's keep this conversation going. Thanks, Faye Good to be with you. God bless you. God bless your family, and may God continue to bless this great nation of Canada. Bye for now.